Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. It is a beautiful, sunny day here in Northern California. It's pretty much always a beautiful, sunny day in Northern California this time of year. It does not rain in the summer, and uh, we rarely get a lot of cloud cover, sometimes. So it's beautiful and sunny and hotter than I would like, but that's just me. My husband is the opposite. He jokes it's only partly a joke that he doesn't leave the house if it's under 50 degrees. <laughs> Whereas I would like, I would love for, you know, the lows to be in the forties and the highs to be in the mid seventies, just all the time. Well, maybe not all the time. I could use some colder weather in the winter. I don't know why I'm telling you my weather preferences, but it, regardless, I mean, it, it, it is a beautiful day here. It is sunny. I soaked up some vitamin D so that it helps my overall mood and day and I hope wherever you are and whatever your weather you found a way to you know get some get some happy endorphins whether that's vitamin D or reading or drinking a nice cup of tea or coffee or you know it's different for everyone. Let's go ahead and talk about books and uh, do an author interview. That's that's what we're here for right? Not Sarah's Daily Weather Report. As I mentioned at the end of the last episode, I have another returning author today. Author Greg Hickey joined me for episode number 223 originally. So if you would like to listen to that interview, you should definitely go check that one out as well. He is uh, joining me today to talk about his new novel, Parabellum. It is... Well, the thing, one thing that I really like about Greg's writing style is that he, he, he takes... Uh, something and makes it into something unexpected so that is very vague let me let me explain that a little bit more the first time Greg joined me on the podcast we talked about his book the friar's lantern and that book is really an adult version of a choose your own adventure book and so that was really cool in this book we get a different way of looking at a crime novel let me go ahead and read you the back of the book Uh, It starts by saying, why does this keep happening? A shooting at a Chicago beach leaves several dead and dozens injured. In the year before the attack, four individuals emerge as possible suspects. An apathetic computer programmer, an ex-college athlete with a history of head injuries, an army veteran turned Chicago cop, a despondent high school student. One of them is the shooter. Discover who and why. So here you have, uh, unfortunately, what is an all too common occurrence in the news. It feels like every day there's another reporting of a shooting. You have a mass shooting in Chicago. And rather than starting with that shooting and then having a a character, you know, such as a detective or maybe even an FBI agent, something along those lines, investigating and looking into this and you reading the story from his or her point of view, instead you go back a year after the initial detailing of the incident. You go back a year and start hearing the experiences of these four characters. They're just referred to by you know, descriptors, the computer programmer, the ex-athlete, the high school student, the cop, etc. And you start walking with them through their lives. So it keeps going back and forth between all four of their perspectives. And so you really become the detective in this story, the person trying to figure out who in fact did this, because all of them seem as though they could possibly have that element in them, that that rage, um, the, the, 
whatever their motivation is and you have to walk through the story reading the perspectives of these four individuals and figure out who actually did it it's a really different way of writing um, a crime novel and I, I thought it was a, a very very interesting approach and so when I say that Greg always takes an interesting approach in his writing that's that's what I meant that he takes something that we might be used to in one format and flips it a little bit uh, examines it from a slightly different perspective a slightly different angle another thing about Greg's writing that uh, I enjoy is that he is a forensic scientist by day that makes him sound like a superhero forensic scientist by day writer by night or weekend or any other time he has time to write and so the science aspects of his novels are always very spot on of course i mean he's a scientist so he's going to write he writes in a way that is explanatory and relatively easy to understand but it's not watered down i mean this is this is science and he presents it as science and sometimes my brain goes whoa that was that was a lot it's very cerebral his writing and so if that is something that you like in your books then this is the, the Greg is a good author for you to turn to speaking of turning to Greg the author let's go ahead and go to the interview with Greg again the the book is called Parabellum and the author is Greg Hickey this call is being recorded Hi, Greg. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much for having me back. I am happy to have you here, and we are here to talk about your book, Parabellum. Before we get to the book, uh, if you could share a little bit about yourself for people who maybe didn't hear the first interview or who need a refresher, that would be great. Sure. My name is Greg Hickey. Um, I'm an author on the side and a forensic scientist by day. So I, I work in a lab in Chicago, um, which handles crimes from Chicago and surrounding suburbs. And I especially work on um, guns and gun related crimes in Chicago and the surrounding areas. And then during my lunch breaks, weekends, evenings, whenever I have some time, I write novels. I like how you threw that in there. Whenever I have time. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, whenever I can squeeze in uh, 10 minutes of writing. And then right. eventually it accumulates into an entire book. Yeah, well, it hasn't been that long since you, you've been on the podcast, so it, this one must not have taken too much time to complete. Um, considering, you know, the, I think this was the first novel that I wrote while working full-time. Um, I'm pleased with the speed at which it came together. I think when we spoke last time, I was probably, I'd probably written a good portion of it already and was probably even either finishing up the first draft or starting to think about editing, editing it. Mm -hmm. Probably that would make sense. So the book, as I said, is called Parabellum. Can you give an overview of the, of the book? Sure. So Parabellum uh, starts with a fictional mass shooting incident in my hometown of Chicago. And then it follows four characters in the year leading up to the attack, the attack and investigates how and why each one of them might have been involved in the shooting. And it's, um, it's very timely, unfortunately, because this is something that is happening a lot in our country with the mass shootings. Is that part of the reason why you chose to, to have that be kind of the, I don't want to say, well, it's not the main focus, but it's the it's the impetus that gets us to the main focus of those four characters. Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I think I originally came up with the idea of wanting to write a sort of response um, in 2012 when there was the shooting in the movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, and then the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, and it's just it's just you know, a very um, simple idea at the time. You know what what is going on here. Why does this keep happening in the United States? Um, what is going on with the, the shooters and why are they doing this? And, um, you know, eventually when I finished whatever novel I was working on, I turned to that question and started to try and just flesh out, you know, wh what are these, how are these um, incidents occurring and what's going on with the shooters? 
let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast now that you've gotten a bit more insight into the book from Greg's perspective. When we come back, we'll be talking more about uh, what I was mentioning earlier about how Greg takes genres and writing styles and kind of looks at them from a different angle. So you're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast gives you advice on everything from hair to fashion to skincare products. We'll talk about the latest trends in makeup, hairstyles, and anti-aging remedies. And we'll cover all of the newest fashion trends. If you have an interest in or questions about the beauty trends that might work best for you, the Golden State Media Concepts Beauty Tips Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Beauty Tips Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. GSMC Book Review Podcast and my interview with author Greg Hickey. We are talking about his crime novel, Parabellum. Let's go ahead and return to that interview. It's it's interesting. This is the second time we have spoken, and the first book that we, we talked about was something of, of a choose-your-own-adventure for adults. This one is not that, but it's it's not your typical novel. It's not your typical crime fiction. It, instead of having a, a protagonist, you know, somebody who's investigating this, we instead get this story from four perspectives of four nameless people who are just described um, by the 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 you know the the athlete, the the veteran, the student, the programmer. Why did you decide to take this approach for writing the novel from those four perspectives? Well, I think I chose to do four characters because I think mass shooters and, and people who commit violence in general don't fall into one specific category. Um, there may, they may have various psychological disorders. They may have vastly different motivations. And I wanted to be able to capture that within one story. Um, so the really was the impetus for the four protagonists it was gave me a chance to explore you know four different psychologies and it was an opportunity to kind of expose the reader to um, different personalities and to kind of challenge the reader to look at these people and see the ways in which each of the characters might be similar to the reader um, and kind of force the reader to, to turn the mirror back on the reader and ask the reader to you know think about themselves and um, the times when maybe they don't act with the amount of empathy that they wish they could. Not, not that any or all readers are, you know, on a slippery, slippery slope towards committing a mass shooting, but we all have instances where we could have been, could have acted with a little more empathy than we did. Right. Yeah. Each character throughout the book has instances of anger, whether those are, you know, large scale anger or just seemingly small incidences, but you can definitely see how those can, can add up in, in some ways, the reader is the, not the protagonist, but the reader becomes kind of the investigator as, as, as they read through these four different people's perspectives. Is that kind of the angle you were going for or? Um, yes, in part. And I think, you know, Parabellum in general, there's, I guess, maybe multiple things going on. It's on the surface level, it, it fits a lot of the tropes of a, a crime fiction novel. You know, there's a big crime, there's possible suspects. Um, we kind of look at each of their motivations, and there are other novels that have done that with, you know, one suspect or many suspects kind of going through, like, the anatomy of a crime. And so that's part of it. Um, and in, in that sense, you know, there isn't a uh, detective in the story, so the reader has the opportunity to play a detective. And I, you know, I think in a lot of crime fiction or mystery novels, that's kind of implied anyway. Um, you know, if you're reading an Agatha Christie novel, whether it's a Hercule Poirot or a Miss Marple novel, where there actually is a detective, 
So whether it's something like, and then there were none, where there is no detective, um, I think readers are kind of read those novels because in part they want to play detective. So that there is part of that in Parabellum. Um, and then, like I talked about earlier, yes, the reader is investigating or kind of thinking about um, which of these characters might have committed a crime, but because there's a sort of generality to each of these characters, I think it also um, asks the reader to look at themselves and look at, um, you know, the ways they might be similar to each of these characters and the ways in which they may act out of anger or without empathy or without compassion um, in their own lives. In terms of character development, what, how much, how much went into each character, each of these four characters before you started writing the story or did you have them kind of fully formed in your head? Were there other options? Just talk in general about all the character develop, development. Sure. So for each of them, I think I started out with kind of, you know, writing out descriptions of each of the characters and the basic traits they want them to have. Um, and I kind of had a particular psychology link to each character. So then I would do research on, you know, the symptoms and the clinical manifestations of that psychological disorder. So, for example, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. I mean, I'd read um, research information ab about the disorder, uh, which would kind of give me, you know, a good framework and a good background for symptoms I should expect to see or I should expect what that character to display, um, kind of the, the progression of the, the disorder um, over time and, and so forth. Um, and then I would also try to read a memoir um, written by someone who is experiencing that disorder. So, for example, for the um, Army veteran, I read a memoir um, about an uh, ex-Marine who had suffered from PTSD. And that gave me kind of the language to describe what was going on with each character, what was going on inside their heads, how they were actually experiencing the symptoms, how they were seeing the world around them. Um, so I, it was kind of a combination of um, fitting the, the factual information about a character and about a particular psychological disorder, and then getting some firsthand, um, firsthand research to kind of give some color to each character and, and make them seem more real and more authentic on the page. Mm -hmm. Did you have more than four in mind? Did you kind of narrow it down to four or were these four, did these four come to you at, at the beginning of the writing process? Um, the, the four that eventually became the four main characters were pretty strong throughout. Um, I, there was a brief period where I thought about including a fifth character who would be um, like a reporter covering the mass shooting and um, would kind of play the role of the general of media, sort of um, aggrandizing the shooter and kind of um, giving the shooter too much credit or too much attention. And just because of the structure of the story and the way that I wanted to focus on the four potential suspects, um, I decided that, that that media character, that reporter character didn't really fit. The characters are described, as I said, just by um, characteristics or profession um, in, throughout the book until the very end. And I'm not going to give anything away about the end, but why did you choose to specifically name them at the end? Everyone's named but the shooter. Sure. So I decided early on that I didn't want to give anyone name. Um, and the main reason for this is I think like I mentioned briefly with the character who got cut, um, I think in a lot of cases where there's a mass shooting, the media um, over-aggrandizes the shooters. Um, so if you uh, think about something like the Las Vegas shooting, um, you know, if you watch news reports, the, the shooter's face um, displayed, there's constant video of the actual shooting, um, the shooter's name is displayed prominently, there's 
if you're watching it in real time, there's a, a running body count, and then it eventually it says, you know, deadliest mass shooting in United States history and so forth. So I, I wanted to, even though I'm, you know, looking at each of these characters in detail and really delving into their backstory, I didn't want, I wanted to do it in a way that was not aggrandizing mass shootings and not encouraging or even um, glorifying violence at this scale or at any scale. Um, so taking away the shooter's name was one way to do that. And, you know, obviously if I started by naming three characters and not naming one character, I think it would be pretty clear to readers where things were headed. So I removed each of those characters' names. Um, and, uh, you know, the second reason I did that is that when you take away a character's name in a book, uh, and this has been done by other authors, so um, Cormac McCarthy's The Road is a good example. Um, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is another example. But it, it lends a generalizability to those characters. So that character is no longer you know, Jim or Jane. It's you know a, a high school student, and there are millions of high school students in the United States. Or it's an army veteran. There are you know hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of army veterans in the United States. Um, and so it it again is another way of asking the reader to kind of tune into these characters and see where these characters fit some aspect of their lives. Um, so that's, that's how I started. And, you know, when I had finished a couple drafts and I sent it to an editor, um, the editor pointed out that it's a really big deal to take away a person's name. Um, you know, it, it strips them of their identity in the story, which, which was part of my intention. But if you think about, you know, just in your personal life, people who have, who go by a nickname or, or prefer to go by their middle name rather than their first name. If you were to call them by the name that they don't choose, that, that can be a big deal for that person. Um, so, so names are important. And I decided that, you know, I wanted to give, give that, those names back to the characters um, who weren't involved in the shooting at the end of the story. It's time to take our second break of the podcast, but when we come back, Greg and I continue talking about the fact that there are named characters. Characters are given names at the end of the book, and uh, in addition to those four unnamed characters who get names, the victims also get names. So we're going to talk more about that. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Podcast. I am speaking today with author Greg Hickey about his new novel, Parabellum. The um, the victims of the mass shooting are also named at at the end when you you describe the incident. Um, that was I'll just say for me that was a very that was a very difficult part of the book to read. I had to kind of skim a lot because I, I just couldn't I couldn't do it at the time I was mm -hmm. reading it, but can you talk a little bit about what went into those characters? Because they're, they're not, you gave them a lot of detail for people that 
uh, that, that, that sounds terrible, that aren't really in the book, but they are important because they are the victims of the shooting. So can you talk a right. little bit about how you develop those characters as well? Yeah, and I, I did want to play up, you know, the fact that, that these people are important, that they have, you know, um, meaningful lives and they have hopes and dreams and aspirations and that are cut short or, you know, either cut short completely um, by the shooting or at least very drastically altered if they're, if they're injured and they survive. Um, and I, I wanted to, um, again, go back to what I think, you know, current media coverage often doesn't do, which is um, doesn't give enough um, focus to the victims of the story and, and tends to focus on the shooter. So, I, you know, even though most of the book is about these, these suspects um, and eventually one of them is the shooter, I did want to give some focus to the victims at, at the end and, and make it clear that, you know, these people are important too. These people have um, meaningful lives that are drastically affected by this incident. The book starts with uh, an opening scene with two characters that we don't see again, having um, they're, they're helping with the aftermath of the crime scene. And they have a conversation about the Oregon Trail. <laughs> um, mm. Did that, did you start there or did that kind of come later in terms of sort of a framing aspect of the book? Um, I, that it, I think that's actually one of the very first scenes I wrote. Um, so I, I had the idea to, to do that really early on. Um, and it's the theme of, you know, maybe not Oregon Trail, but the sort of um, frontier mentality, maybe that's encompassed in Oregon Trail. Um, pops up in a few other places throughout the novel. This idea that, you know, I think America, Americans have this idea that, you know, of constantly being on a frontier, you know, in, in the 1800s, it was the literal frontier where you know, Americans are moving west and following the Oregon Trail or other trails out west. Um, and part of that meant that, you know, if you were out there protecting your family against um, wildlife or, or indigenous people who, you know, whose land you were, were going across, um, it was very useful for you to have a firearm. Um, it's, it's just to protect yourself and make sure that you were able to get to where you wanted to go. Um, and I think that that frontier mentality uh, still exists in the United States today, whether it's, you know, space travel or whether it's something like um, technological innovation. Um, I think that still exists today and that sort of individual, individual individualistic, um, uh, pushing out to new frontiers mentality is, I think, closely tied to um, gun culture in America. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of start with that um, as, as sort of a, a background in the opening scene, and then it, it does pop up in other places throughout the novel. You mentioned reading some memoirs, those sorts of things for character development. What kinds of research did you do for the book? Sure. So uh, I mentioned the memoirs and I, you know, read um, in particular Unholy Ghosts, which is a collection of essays by multiple writers dealing with depression. Um, I read Soft Spots, which is the PTSD memoir I mentioned earlier. I read um, Counting the Days While My Mind Slips Away, which is a memoir from a former NFL player who um, suffered from multiple concussions and, and brain trauma. Um, but I, I started with uh, reading about historical mass shootings and, and um, accounts of uh, malevolence and evil. So um, Dave Cullen's true crime book, uh, Columbine, is, was especially influential. Um, Richard Rhodes's book Masters of Death, which is a account of Nazi extermination squads, so um, pre-concentration camp, they were basically uh, divisions of soldiers who would follow the main Nazi army as they moved across Europe, and they would round up townspeople and execute them by, by a mass firing squad. Um, and so that book's about how you know, ordinary citizens were recruited to, to join this, these squads and how they were transformed into being able to, to carry out these mass executions. Um, 
and then another book was New Demons by Simona Forti, which is uh, about philosophical theories of evil, um, which kind of gave me some of the background for how to think about these characters and how to think about someone moves from you know being a fairly maybe normal person into committing violence or committing mass violence. Um, and obviously, in addition to that, I've read you know the news and analysis of a lot of previous mass shootings that have occurred in the last. Uh, 20 years or so. Is there anything specific that you hope readers might take away from the book, considering its timeliness with all of the, the news stories and all of the mass shootings that continue to happen? Um, yeah, you know, I think I, I set out with the goal of, of trying to find an explanation for why these mass shootings occur. Um, and I, you know, don't think I still completely understand them. Um, but I will say that on a very basic level, they seem to be colossal failures of empathy. empathy. So there's something going on in the shooter's mind, whether it's a, a clinical psychological disorder or whether it's um, just their particular motivation um, that makes them believe that their victims are less than human and that, you know, wiping tens of, you know, or dozens of people out um, in a single incident um, isn't, doesn't really involve the destruction of humanity that, in the way that, you know, most people believe it does. Um, and so a lot of the book is looking at the way in which um, someone can go through that transition from, you know, uh, what we might think of as a normal person to having this colossal failure of empathy and being on the verge of committing mass violence. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, because each of these characters is, is kind of generalizable and because each of these characters has aspects of, um, well, they certainly have, each of them has some aspect of my personality. I'm guessing that a lot of readers will see parts of themselves in these characters, but it's a way to turn the mirror back on the reader and reader to um, try to look at their own lives in the way that they might have not have acted with the empathy that they would like to. It also highlights a lot of aspects of mental health, as, as you've mentioned with PTSD, the, the ex-athlete has, um, I just forgot the acronym, but C, but anyway, oh, multiple PTE. percussion. Yeah. Thank you. I, I kept thinking I, and I knew it, that wasn't right. Um, the, there's the, the high school student who feels just unseen and uh, et cetera. So is there anything specific that you wanted to highlight in terms of mental health or, or really just going back to that concept of how a, an everyday ordinary person can go from that person to being on the, the, the verge or the cusp of an act of violence such as this? Um, well, I, I mean, I think anytime you're talking about gun violence, especially on this scale, you have you can't do it without talking about mental health, um, just as you can't do it without talking about gun safety. But I also didn't want this novel to be sort of a political screed on, on gun safety or on um, mental health issues and mental health funding. Um, so I tried to keep it relatively apolitical and focus on, you know, individuals and what each of us can do to kind of not necessarily prevent mass shootings, but at least, um, you know, be a little bit better in our own lives and, and look at other people with a little more compassion. Mm -hmm. What are you working on now? Is it a somewhat lighter topic maybe? <laughs> uh, Maybe, maybe slightly. So I'm in the very early stages of a new novel, um, just kind of researching and, and outlining at this point. Um, but it's going to be about a character who is diagnosed with a very rare, very rare and very aggressive form of cancer um, that basically leaves him bedridden in the ICU for weeks and probably months on end. Um, and he has to be sedated for a good period of that time. And while he's bedridden, he starts to have these recurring and very vivid dreams. And as he kind of drifts in and out of consciousness and drifts in and out of 
um, sleep and dream states. He begins to realize that as he moves through these recurring dreams and as he you know, performs certain actions in his dreams, um, his disease starts to change and his prognosis starts to change um, along with what happens in the dreams. One last break before we conclude with the interview. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about this work in progress and its writing style. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. GSMC Book Review Podcast. As a quick reminder, before the break, Greg was talking about what he is currently working on, and so that will hopefully make this next question make more sense than just jumping right back into the middle of it. Here is the conclusion of my interview with author Greg Hickey. Because you, you always write in, in an interesting style, as I've, as I've mentioned. Is there a particular angle that you're coming at this story from in terms of writing style? Um... I, I, from a stylistic standpoint, probably not. I mean, I, I think it might be similar to Parabellum in that there'll be kind of parallel narrative threads where you know we'll move back and forth between um, the character in his dreams and the character in, in the real life world, the hospital and cancer treatment. Um, but I, other than that, I'm not planning on doing anything major stylistically. You are a forensic scientist, and you write about science in your in both of the books that I've read from you. There's a lot of science. You present it in a way that is very uh, cerebral. I mean, like you don't you don't dumb down the science, which is great. But how do you approach your knowledge of science and writing about it so that the reader can engage? in that without being a little overwhelmed by scientific facts or terms? So, uh, good question. Um, you know, I, I try to, I guess, focus on the story first. Um, so make sure that I have all the elements of, of what I think will be a good story. Um, you know, we have, intriguing characters and a plot that has some shifts and, you know, maybe not, I wouldn't describe necessarily plot twists, but at least different developments that may be unexpected or um, will evoke a, a certain response in, in readers. Um, and then I think for me, I try to get the, the scientific research and you know, research in general to make sure that what is happening in the story is as factually accurate as I can, as I can get it. Um, so that, there aren't, there, I'm not writing anything in the stories that you know, couldn't actually occur or aren't based on, um, you know, the, the knowledge that we have at this point in time. Um, so the, the research is there to um, support the story, but I, I try to make the story the, the focal point of the novel. Okay. And, and then you mentioned working full time um, and writing and whenever you can so when you take time to read is that mostly for research or do you find any time to read for yourself oh i i always have a book on hand that i'm well almost always have a book on hand that i'm, I'm reading for for pleasure um, that's, that's not research um, and i guess my my reading taste i think they're pretty eclectic um so i read a lot of science fiction i read some crime fiction um i read literary fiction and nonfiction. um Lately, when I looked back at a lot of the books that I've enjoyed in the past or a lot of my, my reading history, um, because I read a fair amount of, of science fiction, because I read a fair amount of classics, um, I realized that I was 
tend to read a lot of white male authors. So I've been trying to focus lately on, on diversifying um, my reading a little bit and trying to get more female authors and more people of color um, and, you know, trying to feel able to be a little bit more diverse within my reading within, within the genres that I enjoy. Nice. That's great. Um, I know you have um, a website, so can you tell people where they can find you on the internet and where they can interact with you on social media? Yes, my website is gregkickywrites.com. So my name and then writes W-R-I-T-E-S. Um, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, I think probably the easiest way to find me is to go to my website and I have links to all my social profiles there or um, readers can search me on, on their preferred social media platform. Um, I wasn't smart enough when I was setting up all my social media to have, it, have them all be the same handle. Um, so <laughs> It's going to my website by the easiest way. Okay. I think that happens to a lot of people when they start setting things up. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that just quite occurs that they need to do that. Um, are there any of your other books that you would like to highlight at this point? Um, you know, I think if readers listen to this podcast and they are intrigued by um, kind of Parabellum and the stories they write, um, they can certainly read uh, the opening chapter of Parabellum on my website. Um, I also have a link to download a, a free short novel on my website, which is called The Theory of Anything, um, which is a good introduction to kind of how I write and how I think about stories. And um, if readers enjoy The Theory of Anything, I think they would also like Parabellum. Okay, thank you. In terms of what we've talked about so far, is is there anything that we haven't covered that you were hoping to mention about Parabellum, about writing, um, uh, anything at all? No, I think this was very thorough. Um, I, think I appreciate you taking the time to read the novel, and uh, I think we covered a lot. All right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about the book. Again, it's called Parabellum, and um, thank you for joining me for a second time on the podcast. Oh, thank you very much, Sarah. My pleasure. All right. So if you are a fan of crime fiction, but you're also a fan of science, not necessarily science fiction, although it's fiction that involves science in this case, but uh, science, crime fiction, a fan of writing that takes not uh, maybe traditional writing styles and uh, looks at them in a slightly different way then you should definitely check out Greg's books. Um, the first one that we spoke about on the episode he was on before is called The Friar's Lantern. That's the Choose Your Own Adventure novel. And this one then is Parabellum, and it is crime fiction. If that is something that you are interested in, you should definitely check them, check out these books and follow Greg on social media, all of those wonderful things. Speaking of those wonderful things, if you are a fan of this podcast, and I hope that you are since you're listening, if you could do me the favor of uh, those things that I ask you to do at the end of every episode, but if you could follow us on social media, that would be great. You can find this podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, GSMC Book Review. You can write a review would be really, really helpful. Either write a review or give us a starred review on whatever platform you listen to the podcast on. That helps to get this po podcast out to more listeners such as yourself. And it's really, really helpful to the podcast. So thank you in advance if you choose to do any of those things. It, if you are on social media and you are following the podcast, please also, you know, send me questions, send me comments. I love to hear from listeners. So uh, take advantage of the craziness that is social media. I hope you will join me next time when I will be speaking with author Allison Levy. This time we get a, an urban fantasy book. It is the book, it's book one in her Damon Collecting series. It's called Gatekeeper. And it is, um, like I said, it's an urban fantasy, and you'll definitely want to check out this interview with Allison. So I hope you're having a wonderful day. I hope you continue to have a wonderful week, and I hope that that week involves plenty of time for you to go and get yourself lost in a good book. Thanks. Mm -hmm.
You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program. Thank you.